Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. Joined by a special co-host, Gil Kidron, from a podcast of Biblical Proportions, to bring you part three, the finale of our series, delving into the incredible lifetime of Judah Maccabee, the Hammer. A Hebrew priest, reinvented into a gifted military commander, that in 166 through to 160 BC, from the mountainous Judean countryside, the land situated around the city of Jerusalem, waged a shockingly effective resistance against their Seleucid Empire overlords called the Maccabean Revolt. A conflict, as covered in Part 1, rooted in a rising tide of social strife among the Hebrews of Judea, between those openly embracing Hellenism versus those determined to preserve their conventional belief system and way of life. A deeply unstable situation, kicked over into open conflict by the Seleucid king, Antiochus IV, as a result of his intervening in Judean religious affairs and later attempts to stomp out the Hebrew faith throughout Judea, igniting, as we learned in part two, the Maccabean revolt as a religiously inspired rebellion, with Judah being appointed as its leader early on in 166 BC, and right away changing the game entirely, establishing himself as a remarkable military leader, training and shaping his rebel band into a fierce guerrilla force, which he expertly employed in symphony with the Judean landscape to put together a string of unbelievable military victories over the vastly superior Seleucid armies sent their way. Most importantly, enabling the Maccabees to gain a firm hold over their homeland and Jerusalem, wherein their holy temple was re-consecrated and traditional Hebrew service restored. Amazing successes that began transforming the ultimate aim of the Maccabean revolt bringing it into uncharted territory, seeking to assert Judean independence from Seleucid rule. Setting the stage for what Gil and I will be venturing into in this episode, with Judah refashioning his guerrilla force into a Hebrew field army, boldly daring to take the Seleucids head-on in pitched battle, resulting in a heavy military setback but with some of the sting lessened due to the establishment of a peace deal, the centerpiece of which was an end to the anti-Jewish decrees implemented by Antiochus IV. However, with a return to armed hostilities unavoidable, when the succession issues plaguing the Seleucid crown brought King Demetrius I into the picture, who ordered a renewed invasion into Judea, but with Judah impressively recovering from the earlier setback to win his greatest battlefield victory yet at the Battle of Adassa in 161 BC. Though a Pyrrhic-like victory, greatly eroding the Maccabean military strength, that was unable to hold back the next Seleucid invasion, one wherein Judah and a small group of his most ardent supporters would be finally overwhelmed in a heroic last stand. But that would nonetheless inspire his successors to continue the Maccabean revolt beyond his death, to eventually achieve the dream of Judean independence. Including what happened afterwards, the ironically sad turmoil that would unfold among the Maccabean successors in power in Judea, in the lead-up to Rome's eventual conquest of the region. However, before we jump into this final installment on Judah, there's a shout-out that I'd like to get to first, being that I have the great pleasure of welcoming Arjan Esfahani into the ranks of the Warlords of History Immortals. My deepest appreciation goes to you, and the existing immortals for supporting the podcast through the Warlords of History Patreon page. And now, I bring you part three, the conclusion of the series on Judah the Hammer and the Maccabean Revolt. (laughs) 
All right, here we are, Gil. I can't wait to get to this one. Our final chapter on Judah the Hammer. Yeah, this will be very dramatic. Definitely. When we last left everything off, it was very late in 164 BC, with Judah and his finely tuned guerrilla army having driven out the Seleucid forces out of Judea, gaining firm control of the region, headlined by their wrestling away of Seleucid control over the city of Jerusalem. Through this, delivering on the primary objective that the Maccabean revolt had been founded upon, a religiously based resistance, by reconsecrating and restoring traditional Hebrew service at the temple, clearing away the stains of the earlier Hellenistic desecration. This having been achieved in the wake of a series of stunning battlefield victories engineered by Judah, from 166 through to 164 BC, the battles of Labona, Beth Horon, and Imaus. In each of those engagements, the Seleucids sending larger and better equipped armies to attempt stamping out the Maccabean revolt, but that were each destroyed in sequence, thanks to Judah's surprisingly ferocious and frankly phenomenal guerrilla campaign that was rapidly surging in momentum. Helped in part by the political headwinds facing the Seleucid crown, when King Antiochus IV had died, resulting in Lysias, regent of the empire, being forced to preemptively cut short his 164 BC campaign into Judea and return to the Seleucid capital of Antioch, to deal with the succession squabbles that had erupted for the crown. That nonetheless was turned into a propaganda victory for the Maccabean revolt, adding to the notion of Judah the Hammer as a living legend, a tailwind of popular support filling the sails of the rebellion, the Hebrews and elites that were previously sitting on the sidelines joining into the ranks of the Maccabees to the tune of around 15,000 Jewish warriors now standing in defiance to the Seleucids. Yes, this is in itself a fantastic achievement for Judah in two short years, from 165 to 163 BCE. His leadership allowed all this to happen and the rebellion to grow significantly. Yes, and also growing in the belief that under Judah's leadership, they could ride this wave of momentum to push beyond the original objective of the rebellion to one of true independence from under Seleucid rule. So here we are. Granted, what's clear is that Judah must have undoubtedly understood, despite all their successes thus far, and despite the political turmoil and succession issues facing the Seleucid crown, that their fight was far from over, which became a sobering reality when Lysias had managed to restore order in the Seleucid capital, apparently feeling secure enough to make ready for yet another campaign into Jerusalem in 162 BC, this time bringing the very best military forces that the Seleucids had to offer, the royal army, 50,000 strong, including heavy infantry, phalanxes, and 5,000 cavalry. Yes, whenever the Seleucids manage to get over their succession problems, they head back to Judea to strike back and try and end this rebellion once and for all. Exactly. And I think what also seems clear is that one of the things from a strategic military perspective that may have crystallized with Judah since the Maccabean reconquest of Jerusalem roughly 18 months prior, is that guerrilla warfare just wasn't going to cut it any longer. Mm. And if he really wanted to make the rebellion into something lasting, a broader, more tangible outcome for his people, freed from under the Seleucids, that he would have to change his rebel force into something else an army that was capable of pitched battles and defeating the Seleucids in that way. 
Wow. Because if that could be accomplished, beating the Seleucids in a straight-up head-to-head battle in the open field where they were strongest, or even gaining a stalemate, possibly reasoning what choice would the Seleucids have other than forcing them to come to terms with Judean sovereignty. Yeah, that speaks to Judah's ambition. Bringing us to, in my mind, one of Judah's most tremendous achievements. Using all the time since the last engagement with the Seleucids and retaking Jerusalem, again about a year and a half ago, to refashion his guerrilla force into a true field army. Using all the weapons and armor that they had acquired in the wake of all the earlier battles they had won. Which leads us to the next huge, huge battle that occurred in May 162 BC, the Battle of Beth Zechariah, to the southwest of Jerusalem. With Yuda leading an army of approximately 15,000, at the core of which were apparently phalanx formations, Jewish phalanxes, no. daring to go toe-to-toe with 50,000 Seleucid troops. <gasps> they must have been imparted with notions of God supporting their cause, I think as you referenced earlier a couple of times. That had to, because like, I mean, somewhat of a suicide mission to yeah. go 15,000 against 50,000, right? Right, so they have to be hardcore believers by this point. And they want so much, so that makes sense. Oh, definitely. Though, as the two armies began amassing in a large plain near Beth Zachariah, ready to give battle, what the Maccabees had apparently not anticipated, nor have a ready counter for, was the arrival of 30 war elephants. Wow. That's dramatic, huh? Uh, very dramatic. At the vanguard of the Seleucid army, that you had these two armies that were lined up on the field, and all of a sudden, these 30 war elephants start charging down on the Maccabean side of the field. Wow. And this greatly unnerved the Maccabean forces, and it drove them to fall back in fear. But this is the moment of an amazing story, that undeniably brave feat provided uh, by Judah's brother, Eleazar. Oh, I love this part. Eleazar saw what was happening to his brother's army. And they were all falling back. They were starting to get really disorganized and unwilling to jump into battle. So Eleazar, by himself, charged forward to attack one of these lumbering beasts. Like, you can see it in your mind's eye. This one lone figure running out to take on an, an elephant, probably with a little platform on top and holding several figures within it as well. It's like uh, Legolas in the, the second uh, <laughs> the second Lord of the Ring movie when he takes this uh, huge elephant heroically. Huh? <laughs> in real life, it ends a little bit differently. <laughs> yeah, well, certainly in this one, he was not as uh, he was not as lucky as Legolas in, in that one because Elazar he charged forward, threw himself underneath the elephant to slice open its abdomen, and he killed it. But then. The huge beast fell to the ground, crushing Eleazar asunder. Wow. It is echoed, this this heroic act echoes through several texts, so it feels real. It did apparently inspire, at least reinvigorate the Maccabean troops to bravely stand up against their Seleucid adversaries in this battle, but sadly, in the end, it just wasn't enough, since... When you look at it from its very starting point, this was the type of battle that the Seleucids excelled at, what their armies had been designed for, and it proceeded to crush the Maccabeans, causing heavy, heavy casualties, perhaps as many as two-thirds of their number lost, approximately 10,000 rebel troops, and it caused the rest to fall back and retreat, scattering, making back for the hills and mountains to return to their guerrilla-type resistance. And it was certainly a heavy blow to the Maccabean cause. Yeah. But one benefit, though, uh, out of all this was Lysias in seeing that although they were defeated, that the Maccabeans remained stubbornly dedicated to keeping their rebellion going on. 
So this convinced the Seleucid commander to make overtures for peace. This is the point that Lysias repeals Antiochus IV's anti-Jewish decrees in response for Judah and his followers laying down their arms. Yeah, and like a sort of uh, amnesty. Right. So if you lay down your arms, things can go back to the way they were before the evil decrees against uh, Jewish worship, Hebrew worship. Yes, and might have been where the Maccabean revolt would have ended, if not for going back to that political turmoil that was unfolding in Antioch. When Demetrius I comes into the picture, and he usurps the Seleucid throne in late 162, and he executes both Lysias and the boy king, Antiochus V. Yeah, the empire by then is very unstable. And how is this uh, Demetrius? Sadly for the Maccabeans, he was apparently another authoritarian ruler. And he was he inherited this, this huge squabble and was a staunch authoritarian. And he was unwilling to apparently accept anything else other than the complete domination of his subjects. So we went from amnesty to war again. Yes. And one of the first things that he did upon ascending to the throne was he decided to crush the Maccabeans for good, since Judah was simply too great a threat in terms of his influence over Judean affairs. And here he appoints a very aggressive and ambitious general called Nicanor. Now it turns into like a colonial war. Now the Seleucids, the Seleucids, they want to turn Judea into a proper colony. So that means that you can take all the Hellenization that we talked about it and ramp it up to 11. Wow. So in that context, we start seeing again meddling in internal Hebrew affairs. And you have the Hebrew priest, high priest, he wants to be high priest, Alchemos, who is working with the Hellenists, and you have all kinds of double crossing and internal uh, internal infighting and purging each other's camps within the, the Hebrews. And Nicanor, he already starts out on the wrong foot trying to trick Judah, claiming that he wants a diplomatic solution. That's a trick. He tries to lure Judah and then kill him. But it doesn't work. Nobody trusts him. And then uh, his true intentions are revealed when he steps into Jerusalem. And it's portrayed, again, his vanity, how he comes into the priests. And now he thinks that all Hebrews are rebels, right? And they're all working together. He insults them. And basically he threatens them that if they don't give up Judah... He's going to destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple. Now the Seleucid general is not only trying to fight Judah and beat his army. He's saying, if you don't hand over Judah to us, we'll destroy your temple. So now the priests and a lot of the elites, they understand that there is only one force (laughs) able to stop Nicanor from destroying the temple, and that's Judah. So instead of giving up Judah, they ask for Judah's help. It coalesces the rebellion even further. Because now it's not just the rebellion and the rebels that are under attack. Now it's everybody, all Hebrews, and the temple. And this is also the last straw for the ancient priestly elite that we started with when they were working with the empire and Hellenizing the Hebrew worship. Hellenizing the Hebrew worship, that's one thing. But inviting a Seleucid general to come over and that Seleucid general now is threatening to destroy the Hebrew temple in Jerusalem, (laughs) that's a whole, whole other thing. So at this time, the corrupt priestly elite is out of the political game within Hebrewdom, because these Hellenized priests are now considered traitors. This is a betrayal. Wow, wow, wow. Absolutely, a complete betrayal. The peace deal that had been previously established torn up and reduced to ashes. 
with Nicanor at the head of 9,000 Seleucid troops now threatening to do the same thing to Jerusalem, its inhabitants, and the temple. Which drove Judah and his followers, who were hiding out in their stomping grounds within the Gophna hills, though of note their number being greatly reduced as a result of the casualties incurred at the Battle of Beth Zechariah, hovering at around 5,000 Jewish warriors now. At Judah's orders, the Maccabean rebels emerged from the Judean wildlands, with Judah stubbornly determined to make another attempt at a full-on pitched battle. Interestingly, by setting up their encampment at a site called Adasa, just north of Jerusalem, but not being quiet about it, essentially inviting Nicanor to come and meet them there, which the Seleucid general made straight for in March 161 BC. And what are the numbers uh, here in this battle uh, on on both sides? So you had 9,000 Seleucids versus 5,000 Maccabean rebels, with Yudha, despite being outnumbered, being the one to initiate the attack. Do you remember the speech that we, uh, from earlier? This is like the few and the many, and he's leading the way. And not using surprises or ambushes, but instead opting for a full-on frontal assault as Nicanor led his army inwards. A short but furious battle erupting, Hebrew infantry charging and slamming into their Seleucid counterparts. And what was his battle strategy here in this one? He focused on targeting the Seleucid general, Mm. which succeeded, because Nicanor was killed early on to the fight, resulting in the Seleucid force falling into disorder, and then abandoning the field and later evacuating Jerusalem as well. So there are many layers to this incredible victory. But first, let's start with the outer layer. This is the greatest victory of them all. I don't think you can overstate how big this was. So Nicanor came in, insulted the priests, threatened to burn the temple, and he cursed at them and dismissed them with his right hand. And after he's killed early on in battle, they find his body, they cut out his right hand, They put it uh, on a stake in the temple, a gate that is later recalled Nicanor Gate. They cut out his head, put it on a pike in Jerusalem where everyone can see it. And they turned this into a holiday, the Nicanor holiday. (laughs) Wow. You mentioned the armies uh, fleeing and dispersing. The way that it's described in uh, 1 Maccabees, they chase them, Judah's armies chase them for 24 hours, trumpeting after them, after them alerting basically everybody that here come the dispersing uh, Seleucid armies. And people everywhere gather and basically butcher the fleeing soldiers. It's a momentous and very, very bloody and gory victory. Agreed. I couldn't agree more. The Battle of Adasa was an incredible victory for Judah and the Maccabees. They proved that they could defeat the Seleucids in the field, not using tricks or ambushes in the effort, but showing that they could be overcome in a straight-up fight. In the aftermath, regaining control over Jerusalem once again. But in my opinion, what makes this battle victory all the more astounding is the fact that the Maccabeans in this instance were coming off a stinging loss in the previous engagement at Bet Zechariah, a loss so heavy that few leaders would have been able to recover from it. But with Judah showing remarkable determination to motivate and rally his rebel forces to once again attempt a full-on pitched battle. Granted, this bringing me to the next, more somber point since this victory was gained at the cost of heavy casualties on both sides. For the Maccabees, their rebel force whittled down and is probably best described as something of a Pyrrhic victory. Since the heavy toll experienced here, along with the losses at the Battle of Bet Zechariah, 
It apparently took the steam out of recruits coming in to fill in the ranks of the rebellion. Yeah, I think it, I think both the victory, the momentousness of the victory takes out a little steam of the from the rebellion because it feels like the final victory and also as you said the pyrrhic side of it the heavy losses that also contributes to the rebellion losing steam and support and just the, the motivation waning once you turn it into a holiday and and you have the head of the of the general maybe that's where judah you know becomes a little bit like icarus uh, that's too much a little bit how how can you win so many battles that you're supposed to lose right Yes, and from a messaging standpoint, I think that it appears that Yudha was getting desperate to um, trumpet, going back to what you said, <laughs> them using the trumpets, trumpet the sense of the ongoing validity of the rebellion. But it, it was really difficult to keep things held together because maybe yeah. war war weariness was starting to set in amongst all the combatants, yeah. and maybe that helps perhaps indicate why there weren't as many recruits that were coming in to fill the yeah. ranks anymore. Yeah, people want, we wanted to go back home now that we won. Why, why are we still uh, fighting? There may have been, to your point, divisions and cracks that were appearing amongst who was left in the rebellion and who was supporting it and to what extent. So, yes, I, I think you're right. There, there were certainly divisions portions of those groups saying well, like how far are we going to take this yeah do we continue until absolutely everyone has been slain and there's nothing left anymore this is already what about eight or so years on from when the rebellion was truly right. kicked off when right. Mathathias had killed that Seleucid representative so right wow how far have we gone right we covered a lot of ground this is like a different world speaking of a different world I think it may have been what had caused Yuda to desperately look for other areas of support. And this is brings us to an event where it's a bit contentious because people claim that, or at least some historians claim that what reportedly happened from here on in was that Yuda struck a deal with the Romans mm -hmm. for support. Some historians believing that this was a full-on alliance with Rome recognizing Judea as an independent state. But what this would ultimately cause was simply just another attack being ordered by Demetrius I. Yeah, which is what makes this momentous victory a Pyrrhic victory. So this is what would end up triggering that another more forceful response from Demetrius, in April 160, when he sent in his general Bacchides at the head of 22,000 troops to put an end, a final end to Yuda and his Maccabean rebellion. And of note is that the Romans did not end up sending any military aid right. to help the Maccabean rebels. And how big do you think was Judah's army at the time? Like in one Maccabees, they say 800, but they might be lowballing it just, you know, to... Do a you know run defense a little bit for what will happen next? What do you think? So I've seen various estimates, and I would agree with you. I think that that's probably a, a little too low of a figure, but it wasn't much higher than that. At most, maybe three thousand warriors, mm -hmm. maybe a little less than that. This being the force that Judah had once again led off into the protection of the Gophna Hills, in learning of the immense Lucid army that was coming their way. However, with the Seleucid general Bacchides unwilling to give chase, where he knew they'd be vulnerable to the Maccabean guerrilla assaults, instead forcing Judah to react by brutally massacring a number of the Jewish settlements en route to Jerusalem, which drove Judah, despite having only those 3,000 warriors at his back to respond and meet the Seleucid force in April 160 BC at a place called Ilasa about 20 kilometers north of Jerusalem. Whereupon, in meeting this enormous 22,000-strong Seleucid force in the field, wow. early on to the battle, this caused more than half of Judah's rebel troops to melt away, 
maybe fed up with the entire revolt and rebellion, but in particular demoralized by this immense force that they were facing and the grim odds that they were facing. And I think around two thirds of that army just simply melted away, fled the field, which left Judah and only around 1,000 of his most valiant troops and supporters to remain there in staunch defiance. And while Judah, as he did in the prior engagement, try to aim what was left of his army to kill the Seleucid commander, Bacchides. Although the veteran Jewish troops, they started cutting a path towards the target. Their ferocious charge ultimately left them surrounded by the much larger Seleucid army. And in my mind, this makes for one of the incredible, memorable last stands of history. You had Judah and his warriors unwilling to surrender, completely surrounded, and fighting to the last man. But they were ultimately overwhelmed by their adversaries and all slain, including Judah himself. Yeah, wow. You you told us really well. About a thousand people followed Judah in the suicide mission. He must have been somebody that people would just like instinctively follow, want to follow, right, into battle. Like a general so brave that charges head on and, you know, Lady Luck is on his side yeah, <laughs> all the time, you know, a.k.a. God. He must have been a complete believer in this notion of pushing it to the very, very end. Like, there was no... There was no compromising by this point. They had passed the point of no return. Of course, it was always galvanized or or being driven by this fact of a religious war. It certainly evolved into that. But it, it had gone, at least in my mind, I think for him, it had gone beyond that point. It was fully intended to get to complete independence or nothing. And when someone's willing to make a last stand like that, just fighting completely surrounded by 20,000 plus Seleucid forces with this 1,000 group of Jewish warriors just cleaving their way into the group, trying to get to the commander. Something fundamental must have been driving Judah and those followers at this point. You know, maybe it was inevitable that it, it would end this way. He kept winning and winning and winning all these improbable battles And maybe he was just destined to lose one of these battles eventually with the few fighting the many. And he just believed that he was the savior of Israel, so he cannot die. So he has to die in an anticlimactic way. I like like this ending. Yeah. But in any case, Judah's death was clearly traumatic for the Hebrews. There's like a sentence uh, about him that we still use today that I didn't know that originated from him. Ech nafal gibor, Moshiach Israel. How, oh, how did our hero fall, the savior of Israel? And today we say, ech naflu giborim. We use that in the, the plural. When somebody in, important to you or meaningful dies, oh, how the mighty have fallen. And it says that, you know, the people mourned his death and uh, honored his life and wept for for many days. And even though he didn't live to see what happened next, without him, there would be no Judaism as we know it today, and hence no Christianity and no Islam and no nothing. This guy that we don't know where he came from, look at what he did. It's incredible. <laughs> Not that I'm uh, that I support uh, massacring and pillaging, but uh, you know, <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> All right, so this is probably a good point for us to now reflect upon his legacy, since we're talking about Hellenists. So this is the the epilogue. After Judah's death, the leadership of the revolt would pass on to his brother, quote-unquote brother, Jonathan, who continued on, not just asserting Jewish freedom to practice their religion, but also, most importantly, strive for independence and self-governance. 
And while after the Battle of Elasa, the Maccabees lost control of Jerusalem and the other main cities in Judea, what Jonathan proceeded to build was more of an unofficial but rival government in the countryside, from between 160 to about 153-ish BC, but also being careful to avoid direct confrontation and conflict with the Seleucids, consolidating Maccabean political leadership over the rural Jewish population, which enabled them to become a notable political force in Judea. Of course, with this leadership position having been entrenched by the legacy of the fiery resistance that Judah had presided over. So accordingly, the Maccabees becoming an important political force, but also of importance was them possessing military capabilities. This being another legacy item coming from Judah that then immerse themselves into the messy series of succession issues that would continue to plague the Seleucid Empire for the next decades. But then later on, upon Jonathan's death in 143, leadership passing on to the last of Judah's surviving brothers, Simon, who continued that practice, but was the one to eventually achieve that Judean dream of religious and political independence in 140 because he's the one that established the Hasmonean dynasty, the dynasty that would rule over Judea and its surrounding regions from 140 to about 37 BC, until the Romans came in. Yeah. And just when we think that we've arrived to the end of the story, it ends with a tragic twist. So let's go back to Judean independence in 140 BCE. So Judah didn't live to see that. But that lasted as the Hebrews dreamt it and wished it. That only lasted for six years and went downhill from there and escalated very quickly. It actually became much worse than ever for the Hebrews. Because uh, Simon, Shimon in Hebrew, he was a very popular ruler. And the Hebrews celebrated independence in 140 BCE. But a mere six years later, Shimon was assassinated in a feast hosted by his father-in-law. What? Oh no, here we go again. He was given wine, he was drunk, and he was assassinated in the feast along with his two eldest sons. Crazy. This I did not know about. Unbelievable. And his one remaining son, called John Hawkinus, he became the leader, and he was completely into Hellenism. He wanted to be a Hellenistic-style despot. He showed disdain to Hebrew tradition. He didn't want to count on the loyalty of the people's military. So what he did is he brought back the clock, gave the temple, the Jerusalem temple, back to those Hellenized Hebrew priestly elites, the corrupt ones <laughs> from the beginning of the story. And he used the money generated from the temple to hire foreign mercenaries as his own personal royal army. Hmm? Unbelievable. All this time that the Hebrews fought against the mercenaries, now their leader, their king, he proclaimed himself king, now he's bringing foreign mercenaries, and his son and heir, called Alexander, he was even worse. And he used those foreign mercenaries to hunt down the rural Hebrews who opposed him. It was a vicious civil war that he started. Okay, I have to come in here. I mean, what a nightmare. How frustratingly ironic is all of that? All of Judah's hard work, his rebels, the leaders that followed thereafter, his brothers Jonathan and Simon, all the blood, sweat, and tears that they had poured into the Maccabean revolt, 
all of it undone from within. Wow. Though another irony that strikes me here was the staying power and influence of Hellenism. We earlier talked about how traditional Hebrew beliefs and values formed the foundation of the rebellion in our story. But even once Judean independence was achieved, it seems rather clear that what remained deeply embedded in the region was that lasting cultural impact of Hellenism. I guess not much of a surprise really, since via Alexander the Great, the Ptolemies, and later the Seleucids, those that occupied Judea for approximately two centuries, like we noted in the previous two episodes, there was of course an almost natural process of at least some of the conquered people to willingly adopt not only the Hellenistic culture, finding it attractive and admirable, the philosophies, art, and language. But what's truly surprising in what you just laid out was for those Hebrews now situated at the top, ruling Judea, the Hasmonean successors after Simon, is that they sought to emulate the Hellenistic monarchs that their predecessors, like Judah, had fought against, laying in complete contrast to the motivations and values of the Maccabean revolt that had brought them to power in Judea. Right, definitely. We know that there is a difference in leaders when they're trying to get power versus when they have power. So here it's over several generations, but the concept is the same. You're doing and saying one thing when you want to get power, and you're doing and saying the complete opposite when you want to keep power, once you have it. And this didn't happen out of nowhere. All of the pieces that led to these disasters, they were put in place in the time of Judah. And the disaster would be as monumental as the victory. Because eventually, as you said, the Romans came in, and that was that. And when you think about it, this is also an incredibly tragic twist, because it was Judah who was credited with pioneering the pact between Rome and the Hebrews against the Seleucid Empire, the Hellenistic Seleucid Empire. But then when the Romans came in, they were much worse than the Seleucids. And they sacked and burned and killed and slaughtered countless of Hebrews and basically ended the Hebrew project in the Hebrew land by deporting those who have not been killed to other parts of of the Roman Empire. And to sever the connection between the Hebrews and the Hebrew land, they renamed the province from Judea, Jews Judea, into Syria Palestina. So Syria, that's because of the Assyrians, it became Assyria, Syria, and Palestina for the Philistines. Hellenistic people who lived a few centuries earlier near Judea. They weren't even in Judea. Like in Judea. They were just near Judea. But the Roman emperor back then, Hadrian, Adrianus, he was very, very Hellenistic. And the name that he chose was after Hellenistic people who were enemies of the Hebrews. So this land specifically became known as Palestina. <laughs> All these events, they still reverberate today, more than 2,000 years later. That's insane. Yeah, you're right. The lasting impact of the Romans in Judea. There's so much to unpack there, but I'll try to keep this brief. So at this point in the timeline, Gil, you brought us to Judea, ruled by the Hasmonean dynasty, once again devolving the region into terrible civil war which gave the Romans the perfect opening to come in and intervene, and eventually take control themselves. In 37 BC, installing Herod I to power in Judea, but as a client kingdom to Rome, followed by, about 30 years later, taking over direct administration of the region. So what happened from there? It was the Romanization of Judea which involved a number of striking similarities 
when considered against the theme of the Hellenization of Judea prevalent in our story. Symbolically, one of the more impactful ones being the Romans building a temple to the Roman god Jupiter on the Temple Mount, as well as reducing many of the Hebrew religious figureheads of the temple to that of puppets of the local Roman governors. Sound familiar? And as expected, these disturbances, among many others, sparking fierce Jewish revolts against Roman rule, a series of terrible costly wars, in some cases with frighteningly high casualties to both sides. However, none that were able to prevent Rome from keeping their thumbs squarely down on Judea. One of the key differences here versus the attempt behind the Seleucids to do the same was simply the size and might of the Roman Empire. Gil, you mentioned the Emperor Hadrian. Well, when he came into power in 117 AD, Rome was at the apex of its territorial height. Dominating the Mediterranean and far beyond, deep into the associated hinterlands, with seemingly inexhaustible resources, especially from a military standpoint, spearheaded by the famed legions of Rome. Whereas the Seleucid Empire, within the context of the Maccabean Revolt, was most certainly an empire in decline, and although possessing a strong military, it never had even been close to the extent of the Roman capabilities at this time. Meaning that, while the Romans did indeed meet with setbacks in the Romanization of Judea, inevitable rebellions, some of these severe setbacks, there was always another tremendously large force of legions ready to go in. At least for this period, a limitless scope of military might that no one was able to overcome. I think an important difference versus that of the Maccabean Rebellion. Without Judah, this whole thing would have been a footnote of a footnote of history. Ah, some locals were unhappy for a time and fought against each other at the end. Judah, he is the one who allowed the Hebrews to dream big. And it's almost as if his victories haunted the subsequent generations who also dreamt big and thought to themselves, okay, if Judah did it, I can be the next Judah. And that is part of what created the tension within Hebrew society and to the calamity at the hands of the Romans. The same Romans that in the official Maccabean history books are called the friends of the Hebrews. And they would go on to become the worst enemies of the Hebrews. It truly was spectacular what Judah was able to achieve during his lifetime. And given everything we have learned about through the series, one thing that rings clearly in my mind is that Judah was an exceptional military commander. He was brave, he led from the front, and expertly used a phenomenal system of intelligence gathering and the landscape in combination with strategic and tactical battlefield brilliance, to deliver an impressive and undeniably effective guerrilla campaign over a much stronger adversary. It's quite astonishing to think about. But also brings to mind a question. Would it have been more effective for Judah to stick with this path, a guerrilla-based resistance? Now, the reason I say this is because his changeover, to form his army into one capable of pitched battles, though a monumental achievement, was seemingly the kiss of death for Judah's rebellion. With the heavy loss at the Battle of Bet Zechariah, and even the Pyrrhic-like victory at the Battle of Adassa, resulting in the revolt losing momentum, along with greatly eroding the Maccabean military strength. Not to mention that, Judah may have been out of his depth a little bit as a general of a Hebrew field army, arguably biting off more than he could chew. Now, I think there's no question that he was an excellent guerrilla commander. 
However, based on the military figures that I've come across and researched thus far, including Judah, notably few were able to convincingly make this massive leap or transition from guerrilla commander to field army general. And although he did see some successes as a general, pitched battles of that sort is where the Seleucid army excelled, what they had been designed for. And in Judah opting for that path, this could be viewed as one of the few errors in judgment rendered by him. Which makes me wonder how things might have worked out differently had he stayed the course with the guerrilla campaign, attempting to win the overarching conflict through attrition. Keeping to the mountainous Judean countryside, waiting out the larger Seleucid armies to take their leave of the area, since there was always another fire arising that they needed to go to and stomp out elsewhere in their enormous empire. And that would have enabled Judah to bring his rebel forces back into Jerusalem to overwhelm the smaller Seleucid garrisons left behind. Had he done that, continually, perhaps he would have been the one to establish Judea as an independent state earlier than it turned out. But in any event, irrespective of what happened afterwards, the Maccabean Rebellion and the inspiration that Judah provided, in the end, in my mind, has to be seen as a success. Since Judea's inhabitants were ultimately freed to practice their faith without interference, and roughly two decades after his death, affirmed Judea as an independent, self-governing state. This, of course, coming from my more secular point of view. But what of the biblical accounts of these events, Gil? What's your final thoughts on how the Maccabean Revolt and Judah are portrayed within these works? So this is my hypothesis. Scholars are unanimous that the Bible was already complete by 250 BCE, so before Judah's time. But I disagree. I see Maccabean stories all over the Bible that they added. Many of the battles we discussed in these three episodes were turned into folk tales that you can find today in the the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, mostly in the books of Judges and 1 and 2 Samuel. I'll just give one Example. Let me go over the plot of a famous, very famous biblical story. I think the details in this story will sound very, very familiar. So I'll just omit the characters' names in this biblical folktale so <laughs> we can see how much Judah it is. So this folktale is about an audacious, and bold Judean hero that has God by his side to make him victorious in battle. Victorious against a Hellenistic enemy, a much stronger and better equipped Hellenistic enemy. The leader of the Hellenistic enemy is vain and he insults the Hebrews and our audacious hero, he stands up to him and all he has is a slingshot. And with his slingshot, this Hebrew folk hero, he takes on the bigger, stronger, better equipped enemy head on in open battle. No tricks, no maneuvers. Open battle, face to face. And the hero wins the battle with his slingshot. And he takes the enemy's sword for his own. And when the enemy leader is dead, the entire Hellenistic military descends into chaos and flees. And the Hebrews, they chase after them relentlessly, hunt them down, butcher them down to the last men. And to top it off, as a revenge against this profane Hellenistic leader, the hero cuts off his head and takes it to Jerusalem for all to see and celebrate. This is just a recap of a story in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17. I omitted the names. The name of the Hebrew hero character in this story 
with a slingshot. His name in the story is David. And the name of the bigger, stronger enemy who loses his head, his name is Goliath. Ah, uh, yeah, so similar. So to me, this sure sounds like a folktale about Judah the Maccabee, immortalized as David. Everybody knew about David back then. They were writing a new story giving David the exploits of Judah. Starting out with a slingshot, no gear, nothing. Vanquishing the enemy, taking the enemy's swords. Judah did that to Apollonius. And then at the end, the killing of the vain Nicanor, cutting off his head, bringing his head to Jerusalem, and hunting down all his troops. All the details that we discussed are here. And Judah, in real life, and David in his folktale, they hunt down the fleeing Hellenistic soldiers to the same place. Exactly like a few kilometers from one another. It's astounding. So Judah chases them all the way to Gezer. And in the folktale, they chase them all the way to Ekron and Gat. I looked at the map. It's exactly in the same spot. 30, 40 kilometers northwest of Jerusalem and the same distance from the Mediterranean Sea. Identical site. It's either the most incredible coincidence ever or David versus Goliath is a folk tale meant to commemorate and immortalize Judah the Maccabee. The little guy against the big guy, the few against the many. So this is the sort of thing that I do on my podcast. And finding the reality behind the legend, that's something that I love doing. Excellent. And just before signing off, I just want to take a moment here, Gil, to mention how much of an absolute pleasure it's been to work with you on the series. And for all the fascinating insights, biblical and historical that you provided, giving so much color to Judah's story. I wish you the best of luck and success heading into the future, both for you and your outstanding podcast. Sure, and uh, I would like to thank you, Mark. I learned so much, and I couldn't have learned it without you. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Now, as much as I hope you've enjoyed the show's little departure from the norm, collaborating with Gil on the story of Judah the Hammer, for the next episode, it's back to a solo operation. And I'm extremely excited to finally begin on the deep dive and series on Scipio Africanus, the famed general who arose out of the late 3rd century BC Roman Republic, appearing as its savior at one of Rome's darkest moments when brought precariously close to the edge of calamity during the Second Punic War at the hands of the Carthaginian commander Hannibal Barca. Headlined by Scipio's brilliantly executed military campaigns in Hispania and later North Africa that were of fundamental importance to the eventual forcing of Carthage to its knees, driving Rome to not only become the dominant power in the western Mediterranean, but also setting the stage for it to assume a leading position as the dominant state of the ancient world, all of which we'll get to in due course. But at the starting point of Scipio's story, the focus of the upcoming initial episode, where we'll spend some time delving into the social and political climate of the Rome that Scipio was born into and raised within, including the tumultuous environment that led to the Roman Republic emerging as a regional power on the Italian peninsula. At its core, imbued with a fierce warrior culture and militant outlook, reflected in practically every facet of Roman life, especially in the religion, values, and virtues of its people, helping to shape the young Scipio's character and mindset, the lens through which he would have understood the world around him alongside the upbringing and education that a youth from an elite patrician family like him would have been subjected to, amidst heavy expectations to add to his family's legacy. 
all the fundamental building blocks and influences that would later drive Scipio to become one of the greatest military strategists and tacticians of the ancient world. This and more to follow in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. And while waiting for the next one to drop, I would highly recommend having a listen of Gil's podcast, a podcast of biblical proportions, which I'll include a link to in the show's notes. Especially for those of you intrigued with the stories found in the Bible, the Old Testament, Gil does a phenomenal job of breaking down the historical events and social environment that led to these stories being written in the way that we now find them. And lastly, if you want to support the Warlords of History podcast, there's lots of ways to help. It would be greatly appreciated if you could rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And finally, you can head on over to the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com, where I'll include some additional info, like images and maps pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure and where you can also reach out to me with any thoughts, questions, or suggestions. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Theme music from Audionautics.com